Hello, welcome to our session on protecting the enterprise. I'm Pam Kubiatowski, Senior Director of Transformation Strategy with Zscaler. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us. In the last six months, it's gotten a little more complicated as so many companies were thrust into a remote workforce, whether they were ready or not. I've talked to many in the previous months that were on both ends of the spectrum. Some didn't have technology in place in order to support a remote workforce. Others were highly remote. But for those that were somewhere in the middle, they seem to have found themselves accelerated into a digital transformation with a focus on security. I'm so glad to be joined here today with this distinguished panel. Here we have Oliveira, and I've, I've already pre-warned everybody on the last names. <laughs> Oliveira Zitzola from Huawei, Shahid Say from ML MLSE, Michael Ball from Team VCSO, and then Samir Adi from Good Food. Thank you all so much for joining me in this uh, panel discussion. If you could, um, Oliveira, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll go around. Yeah, hi, good morning everybody. I'm Oliveira Zatezala and I'm Chief Security Officer at Huawei Canada. It's my responsibility to work with the Canadian government in open and transparent fashion to make sure everything Huawei sells in Canada is up to Canadian uh, laws and regulations. Prior to joining Huawei, I spent over 20 years in telecommunication industry, so I have a lot of experience setting up governance, management, and cybersecurity operations and security operations centers to monitor the network. So this is my background. So I'm happy to be here to share the experience. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, Shahid? Hi, my name is uh, Shahid Saya. I'm the head of cybersecurity at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, uh, the world champions Raptor Toronto Raptors. Uh, I've been uh, my role uh, uh, involves managing cybersecurity for the whole organization, from teams to corporate, corporate to uh, our food and beverage, and and various other partners. Uh, prior to joining MLSC, I was head of cybersecurity and technology operations at a few fintech companies uh, over the last 15 years in Toronto. I'm happy to join and share my experience with you guys today. Great. Thank you. How about you, Michael? So I'm Michael Ball, and I'm uh, what you would call a virtual CISO uh, with a series of small companies. So I, I run a business called Team CISO, and we look after mid-tier businesses. That's awesome. And last but not least, Samir. So my name is Samir Adi. I'm the head of IT infrastructure and uh, security for uh, Good Food. Uh, it's a startup company, uh, six years old. And with the recent time of people working from home, uh, we start to see more increase and in demand on people want to order their meal ready to be uh, delivered at, 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 their, uh, uh, at their home. So joining the company to start building a proper infrastructure, secure infrastructure to meet the demand of our subscribers. Before that, for almost 30 years now in my career, worked in different sectors uh, in uh, financial, payment processing, retail, just, just name it, oil and gas, and I'm happy to be with, uh, with the panel today. That's great, thank you. So, you know, I think it's interesting, right? Um, the world has shifted immensely in the last six months. Um, you know, if we were having this conversation six, nine months ago, we would be really talking about that, you know, how the actual perimeter, the edge of, um, you know, a network would be changing and how people, how companies have started that change. But now that we're six months into a, a, an entirely different sort of workforce, right, and where data is sitting, and how some have been thrust into changing. Um, you know, let's start with you, um, Olivera. What do you think now is really, what, what's your idea for protecting the enterprise and how, and how should companies go about that? Okay, thank you for that question. So I think the key is to make sure your upper management understand the importance of cybersecurity. So I think the key in establishing any cybersecurity uh, governance, management uh, operation is to make sure your upper management understand the, the importance and he and they actually support you. 
The reason for that is you're going to require a lot of budget to implement what you need to, uh, to, to implement. And I think uh, without upper management support, in giving you a budget and also in making sure that you have resources to implement what you need to implement, uh, it's going to be almost impossible. So I think what I would like to say is that when we say cybersecurity is everybody's responsibility, we literally have to start for the top management. They need to understand that. They need to give you to enable CISOs to do their work. And CISOs' work is to actually do the cybersecurity risk assessment first. So we need to understand what we what are we trying to protect? What are the crown jewels in our enterprise? And we need to actually try to understand what are the gaps, like what do what controls do we have in place and what controls are missing. So I think in order to implement a good cybersecurity practice, we first have to do a gap analysis to clearly understand where we are and where we need to be. For uh, for somebody who is coming from the telco background, in telco we are using NIST standards. So for us it's easy. We have a clearly defined standards with 500 security controls split across 17 domains. So we go and check and we see this is the controls that we have and these are the controls that are missing. So I think first is gap analysis so using some of the well-known and established cybersecurity risk management practices for your industry. Then once you understand what is the gap, you go to implement a governance. Governance means the policies to educate people what do they need to do. Once you establish the policies, which is a cybersecurity governance, then you go and you implement a cybersecurity management, which is basically implementing the controls based on these policies. Uh, to make sure you have IT control, you have network controls, you have uh, physical security controls, whatever you need to do. And then the very last step is cybersecurity operations. So once you implement these controls, you have to monitor them 724. In telecommunication space, we usually employ uh, like um, security operation centers that monitor the network 724 around the clock, they raise alarms and something goes wrong. So I think what I would like to summarize, this is a, a very challenging and difficult <laughs> work that has to be done, but if I can summarize in four uh, key points, this is make sure you have upper management control, uh, upper management support. Second is do the gap analysis and based on your gap analysis, implement cybersecurity governance, which is a set of policies, then management, which is a set of controls in IT systems and network system, and the third one, operations to monitor 724. So I think this is the key to establishing a good cybersecurity practice. That's great. That's great. So um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, Sheed, what your thoughts are, and then I'm going to move to Summer. Nope. Oh. Gotta love technology, right? I apologize. I was <laughs> muted. So, uh, so what I was going to say is uh, just to add to what Elevator said, she covered quite a bit. Uh, so what I would I would say when what my definition of protecting the organization is that in any organization I go in, so let's say MLSC is, the first thing is to really understand what the company's business is. Because, you know, if you want to be a strategic CISO, you want to understand what the company does and how they generate revenue. And, you know, over time, absolutely, like protecting the crown jewels is is always what cybersecurity is focused on. But for me, these days, I talk more about how to protect revenue for the organization and help generate revenue. So those are the areas I focus on. So that means understanding what the main key risks to each line of business are, and then working with those leaders to understand what risks we are willing to accept. And then that's where the risk assessments come in from a cyber perspective to help them assess the risk and say, these risks, cyber is comfortable accepting as long as you are, or these are not what we're going to accept. And for the industry I am in, there's not a much a lot of regulations except, uh, you know, we have to be privacy, pivot compliant and stuff. So we have to, again, have a lot of buy-in from the executive team and the board. And once you have that, cybersecurity becomes a little bit easier to uh, sort of bring the culture of cybersecurity when you have a top-down approach. 
That's great. I, I think you you really have hit on a topic that we're going to talk about a little bit more later is risk, right? And what is the risk appetite, and what how has that changed, right? In in these last six months, uh, for many companies, I think it, it has changed, all right? Because when you did your you know your BCPs before and everyone had it all structured and nice and neat, you know, how much of those BCPs were ready for what we faced and how did risk play into all of that, right? So with that, um, I'm gonna move over to Summer. What do you think? So <clears throat> what I think actually in this, in this domain is, uh, as, as Shahid said, first we need to understand the type of the business and what, what considered as crown jewel for the organization. So some organizations, they have IP, they sell software, they sell code, they sell uh, services to the people without, uh, without having any uh, personal information or personal data within their infrastructure. Other companies, their crown jewels actually is the data they hold on their uh, subscribers, on their customers, on their, on their clients. So understand what type of data you have, what type of crown jewels you have in the company is, is make a big difference. Also follow the money concept is how we generate revenue for the organization. It doesn't make sense to spend too much time and money and effort on something at the end of the day will not add value to the company. So we understand what's the crown jewels, we understand uh, how, how the revenue generated in the company, and then we start looking at all, all the players within the security domain. So we look at users, which, which they are the most important part of this one, then we look at the endpoints, then we look at what controls we have in place, your communication lines, your protocols, and also one of the most important things is how you define and how you protect your back-end systems and solutions. Controls and, and, and meeting some regulations is, is good and important for the people who are working in industry that it is regulated, but not, not all of us are that in, in that domain, not all of us as banks, not all of us in, in the payment industry. So we need sometimes to improvise on how we want to manage the security for the organization that will keep the business running. Because again, I keep saying that the most secure way to do the business is not to do the business. If I don't have a website, nobody will be able to get into my environment. But this is not the way how we generate revenue. Our, our company, all our revenue coming from, somebody will go to the website, somebody will like what we are offering to them, subscribe, pay the money, deliver the food to them, and keep, keep rotating. So there's not too much of, of a wiggle room within what we do for, for the organization. That's great. <clears throat> and Michael? So, last but not least, Michael. Last but not <laughs> least. So, so I hate to say it, but I'm going to say my, my role is a little bit different in that my clients are all um, small shops. So, um, you know, from 50 to 1,500 seats kind of thing, they, they, they don't have typically a cybersecurity program in place. They don't typically have the resources and the tooling that a large enterprise would have. So, so a lot of our um, impetus is in and around the awareness training, the maturity assessment up front, understanding their risk, and, and you know, putting process rather than tooling in place. Interesting. Uh, we've got a nice, uh, you know, it, it, interesting um, points of view you all are coming from, but yet so similar in so many different ways because, you know, based on the different types of industries and um, footprints, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one of the questions I have for all of you, and, and Michael, if you don't mind, we're going we're gonna to start with you, sure. um, and we're going to work our way backwards. But if you went ahead and, uh, you know, during this time, uh, you had you had an era where you had implemented and you were protecting, right, your enterprise yep. during the work at home era. Um, prior to the six months, and then now after, what what have you done differently? What has changed? What has shifted for you? Um, and I understand, you know, you have all these different um, um, companies that you know mm -hmm. you're supporting. But in that, how did that change? So, so I'm going to say that uh, similar to larger enterprises, most of the employees um, would periodically work from home, but that wasn't their their primary. And so things like um, large-scale VPN access wasn't provisioned prior to COVID. 
So, so you know, most of the employees would not have a VPN access back to the office. Specific executives would. And COVID came along, and all of a sudden, you know, we're we're rolling out large-scale access, and not really thinking through uh, how to set up the group's security properly. So, so um, large amounts of carte blanche access was given. And then we found out that most of those employees actually didn't even need to access the uh, the network in the first place. So, so they were okay running Microsoft Office 365 back to the cloud. Um, all of the security controls that we put in place were absolutely subverted um, to the point where we no longer had access to those systems. They wouldn't log in. There was no automatic VPN connection, and we lost monitoring, we lost patching and updates. You know, the, it was a little bit of chaos up front until we literally had to do a manual um, process of bringing laptops back or having them connect back so we could push policy to enforce these things. Mm. Kind of uh, <laughs> biting your nails at a, at, a, at a certain point, right? Yeah. I think the other thing that you, you, know, you touched on is I think a lot of companies have struggled with creating role-based role -based approaches, right, yeah. to their end users and figuring out, um, you know, who needs what in their roles and then having that role base then implemented within your environment to know that when something like this occurs, well, a flip of a switch maybe, you know, ignites that role or they already have what they need. So that's interesting. Samir, how about you? How, how, how did you find, um, you know, the working from home era change, or if it did at all, did you have to adjust? Actually, yeah, definitely we, we have to adjust. Uh, again, the, the number of the people now start working from home is, is way more than, than before. Uh, the enterprise protection now is not within our data centers. It's not within the server room we have in the building. It is actually in my living room and your living room and, and somebody else's living room. So now the line of defense for us have been shifted dramatically to be in a different place. Uh, start actually forcing or enforcing the cyber security training and the awareness for the users make a big difference for them on how to uh, how to protect themselves against against certain type of attacks how to use the, the the right protocol to connect to the environment as Michael said some users doesn't need actually VPN they can go to whatever cloud service you have to check their emails and do the, their 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 files and then Excel sheets and and whatsoever, but therefore the uh, privileged users, we will say, or the people who will have access to admin the network, to admin the server, to admin the database, we need to implement it for them, uh, a quick solution for VPN. We need also to mandate uh, the, the, the domain authentication for the devices. So in most of the cases, we cannot just use your personal device for this one, even though the users would love to do that. So domain activation for devices, authentication for devices, start pushing more often the group policies we need to those devices, start monitor closely the, the antivirus updates, the group policies updates, the, the protection and the endpoint, the DLP policies, all those type of small things that sometimes when you are in the office, you don't pay too much attention for them. But now when, when most of the users are at home, we start paying more attention to that one. Again, it's, it's, it's where you start your defense now. Is it at home or it's in the office? And this, I think, make big difference for, uh, for the organizations. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very true. And, and you know, now that we have such a massive work from anywhere, we're, we're kind of calling it right, because who knows where you're working from now. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you look at this massive workforce that is remote, and there's such a massive target on them, right? The bad guys have just, they're like cockroaches. They're coming out of the woodwork right now, just focusing wherever they can to attack. And the attack now, what we're seeing is attacks on the end users because they're the most vulnerable right now, right? And securing them like you would have secured them in your, in your premise. Um, for some companies we've seen has become very challenging to figure out what is the right mix of that technology, right? So I, I think it's a very interesting predicament so many companies are facing um, of how they're going to go ahead and um, secure those end users. Shahid, how about you? 
So uh, I would say for us, uh, not much changed. Uh, we, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, we at MLSC, I've been very blessed to have a really good leader on the technology side that we've partnered with to be a cloud first organization from the get go anyways. Uh, what we've been able to do is since I've joined MLSC is we've also become a cloud first cybersecurity organization where we're not relying as much on our VPNs or antiviruses that are on-prem. So everything, uh, what we've done is we've used products that are completely in the cloud. So that way nothing has to call home and all you need is some sort of agent on an uh, end user's machine. Uh, where What has changed for us over the last six months is the amount of monitoring uh, we have to do on cybersecurity side. And, and what you touched on, Pamela, is because employees are working from anywhere and everywhere, and now they're the most vulnerable that they've ever been before. So, you know, a person in the office would never use their computer to watch Netflix or any other sort of uh, online uh, content, but now they are. So, so sort of viewing that, and the other thing we've noticed is is uh, the the amount of phishing attacks that we've seen have in, increased dramatically for not just our organization across the globe. Uh, so I would say that has changed for us, but how we've done security, how we've laid our architecture, uh, I, I'm actually very proud of what we've done at MLSC and and you know just being that company where we didn't just rely on the perimeter to protect us. That's awesome. Um, you know, you, I think when you look at where you're at in your, you know, your digital transformation, so forth, you're you're further than others. And thinking about the fact that that perimeter has shifted, right? We all kind of joked a number of years ago um, that you know the internet really is the new network, right? Yeah. The perimeter, you know, the, the data center is the, is the cloud, where your data resides. And one of the things we, we, we talk about all the time at Zscaler with, with customers and prospects is, you know, it's your user is going to be wherever they're at. Mm -hmm. And it should be all about the fact of being able to give them the technology to get them securely to wherever that application is sitting, right? And protect them. You know, we always talk about protecting them before all of those endpoint protections have to kick in. How do I stop bad traffic before it ever gets to an end user to make sure that whatever's on that endpoint is the last stitch? It's like the insurance policy. I'm going to catch it if it gets to me, right? Um, because our users are everywhere now in the prim and the enterprise perimeter is gone, right? In so many instances. But how about you, Olivera? Okay, so thank you for that. I think that's a very important point. And um, uh, I think it all starts with the end users' cybersecurity awareness. I think we have to make sure people understand that technology can just go so far and they have a role to play in protected. They have a role to, to, to play and underst to understand where the risk comes to, uh, to because there is just so much we can do with technology. So speaking about telecommunication, like telecommunication companies, they are usually um, set up to do teleworking. So we have teleworking uh, practice uh, going on for a number of years. So we didn't have a problem doing that. I think what we had to focus on is that first, as somebody who is essential service, we had to understand right away that not everybody can work from home. There are some positions that have to stay in office. And then we had to go back to our business continuity plans and to make sure that now during pandemic, which is also a part of the business continuity planning, we have to have different groups to make sure people don't mingle, you know, to protect the, the, the people who are coming to the office. So this is the first area we had to look into. Then when uh, we looked into uh, moving the rest of the uh, workforce to home, we look at the applications and systems they're using, and we wanted to make sure the data they're seeing and they're like viewing from home right now, they are protected. So basically not each and every application we have or system can be used from home. So this is another area like we had to do not just cybersecurity, but privacy assessment of the data our employees are, are actually working with at home and to make sure we have controls around that. So this is the first step we had to take. And then, as I said, because we had these teleworking policies in place before the pandemic, before March, 
we had to focus more on the uh, uh, capacity planning. Mm -hmm. So basically, now that we had more people uh, working from home, we had to make sure we had enough capacity and we see a huge increase in demand uh, and usage. And uh, we had to closely monitor that and help not just ourselves, but help our customers who are providing telecommunication services to the rest of Canada uh, to uh, performance tune their network to make sure they don't have any issues providing um, telecommunication services. And maybe it's a moment just to recognize it right now, just to recognize the great job the telecommunication companies and telecommunications, uh, telecommunication engineers has, have done over the last six months because we literally moved to remote work, for, uh, work, uh, work from some home and, and use networks not just to work, but to entertain ourselves and to keep in touch with the family. So with the family. So basically, um, I, I'd like to take a moment just to recognize the great work that Canadian telecommunication companies have done. That's great. I think I think you bring up a very, very um, valid point. The capacity that you saw companies that supported the infrastructure portion, right, of this um, this newly <laughs> this massive work from anywhere um, force that we have had, we've seen in the last six months, you know, we saw capacity grow over 300% from um, one of our products called, it's private access, Z-Scale private access, right? It's really a replacement for VPN and getting into internal applications for companies, you know, and that was a global um, increase, 300% within days. Because uh, you saw this shift of everyone going home and literally taking all their devices right from their desk, going home to now be doing their job. But I think, you know, some of the companies we've talked to and I've talked to, one of the things they did is in order to get that additional workforce productive from home, to your point, they had increased capacity also, whether it's their VPN concentrators or so forth. And I think sometimes... Some of the companies I'm talking to now feel that, okay, well, we invested in our, our VPN infrastructure in order to make this all work. And now this is sitting in our books for the next couple of years. I'm kind of stuck here, right? And it scares me and I try to explain to them, no, you still have some of your infrastructure is going to start coming off depreciation. You've got to start to figure out how to make that shift, right? Because not everything's going to always reside in those walls of your data center. And you need to make this very flexible for your end users, right? A, a person, a user shouldn't have to think about where that application's sitting. They should you have that experience just like you're at the office, right? You don't think about is SAP in my data center or am I going to office 365? If you're sitting in, in an office, you just go to office 365. It's like magic, mm -hmm. right? And I think those are the things that companies also um, need to start to think about is how do they start making that change, right? And I think this ties into the work from home experience right now is really, I think, somewhat clouded. And, and I'd be interested to get your opinions on this because it's not a typical work from home environment. Um, your users aren't just going home sitting at a kitchen table or, or in there, you know, at a, at a desk and just working because in a lot of instances, the kids are still home. They're being homeschooled. They're doing e-learning. Um, it's not like, you know, or maybe there's only one laptop in the house and it's actually the, the work laptop, right? So when you look at that and users having to get their job done with juggling the environment we're currently in, um, it seems like they're trying to, to be as productive as possible and as efficient with their time and so do you see that freedom, that flexibility that users are looking for of, of trying to potentially just get their job done? Is that creating challenges for any of you or things that you're worrying about um, with this at home you know, workforce now? And, and we're going to go in the reverse order here. <laughs> it's just easy. So Alvera, what, what are your thoughts? So as I said, um, from, from us, uh, we I didn't see a big change because some of these jobs were done from home before. So from that perspective, uh, I didn't see much change. As I said, in the telecommunication industry, like people are working from home for a number of years right now. So it's definitely uh, more like a cultural change that had to come from 
HR to um, educate people to give some flexibility to the um, teams at, uh, teams with um, with the smaller younger families and stuff like that and uh, and also like a cultural change because we don't see each other face to face on a daily basis uh, we had to uh, maybe have like uh, team meetings more often so for example uh, during these pandemics I had uh, like a team meeting every day three o'clock we all get together when we were off it's like we didn't have a need to do that we would do it like uh, once a week so like that kind of changes we have to implement based on the situ situation and circumstances. And also we ask people to be more flexible, especially for the for the team players with the younger family. But um, when it comes to technology, uh, I did not have to do like more changes. Like we were pretty much set up. That's great. Sheet, how about you? So I, I would uh, sort of touch more on the scenario you use where there's one laptop and, you know, it's it's the same laptop being used and, and it is a reality. So I, I think that as CISOs, uh, we, we're ingrained to be risk averse, you know, not accepting risk. But I think during times like these, uh, I think our risk appetite has to change as CISOs also to accommodate the organization and the people who are running these organizations, right? So, so my view on that is that, you know, again, if you, as a as a as a head of cybersecurity, you have a good understanding of your business and good understanding of your, you know, your digital assets and your crown jewels, what they are and where they are. If somebody's coming in saying, "Hey, I want to use a new tool because the IT team is so busy dealing with all the other issues, I will not get this tool for next month," for example, or I need to be able to use, uh, you know, a new platform to teach my kid on it. Are you okay with it, right? I think as a secure team, you're successful if uh, your employees in your organization trust you to have those conversations. So you've done a good job to make everyone security aware. Uh, and I think my stance today is like, you know, we are willing to accommodate as long as you're not sort of exposing our organization to risk that we're, we're not comfortable taking. But if it's a small risk and, and you know, during these times, my risk appetite has grown a little bit bigger than it was before pre-COVID, right? And just, and I think you, as leaders, you have to show empathy around this time. So that's what I would say, like, that's what I've been able to do with our leadership team and, and, and our employee base. It's a, it's a balancing act right now, right? Yes, exactly. It, you really have to figure out what's, what's the right balance for your company and what is the risk appetite you're willing to accept. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and we might be accepting certain risks that we would have never thought of accepting before pre-COVID. But, you know, uh, in times of uncertainty, you have to step up and help the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Samer, how about you? So actually, I will agree with Olivera on the culture side of, of the change. So people working from home now with the families, with the kids. So it's it's very normal to be in a meeting and then the child pop up in, in the screen for or, or somebody ask about something. So this is this is now start getting uh, more used to it. But also this this new environment introduced a new risk to the technology actually because users are users and they are if they are at home and they have been doing a task that they did not getting or provided by, by their company with a laptop. So now they are at home and they want to work, good for them, and, and we really appreciate their effort. But now they are start asking us to allow their home devices to be connected to the network. Mm -hmm. And from a technology perspective, this is a risk because this is unmanaged device for me. This is unsecured device for me. And this is will be an entry point to my, my environment. So wearing the security hat, make me very anxious actually and, and thinking about this but also my role with the company is i'm responsible for the infrastructure and i'm responsible mm -hmm. to keep everybody connected and everybody pro productive so balance the act between should we accept the risk and our risk appetite getting a little bit more more than before or should we shut down the door for everybody so we start balance between you can use your personal device. We may push some updates to that device. We may need to manage a, a business uh, container on that device until we reach to a stage where we can ship you a laptop or ship you a device that it is a corporate device with the corporate standard. So yeah, we needed to balance between 
the risk of people sitting at home doing nothing or accept the technology risk, them using their personal devices to connect to the network and do the work we want them to do. Well, let's face it too, um, for some companies early on, um, couldn't get hardware, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I think some companies had to accept the fact of, of users using their own devices until they could get actually hardware um, to send out there. And, you know, you made a very interesting point also is that we've all become so tolerable. I think for so long we were intolerable, intolerable, sorry, for, you know, the dog barking in the background, right? From somebody working ho at home or you're like, oh, that's just not professional. And now kids will run in the background, the dogs will be barking, the do doorbell's ringing. It's so interesting how you've seen all levels from executives um, down in a, that are just, it's okay, it's fine, right? Um, so it, it's kind of nice to see the shift in acceptance of what's going on in people's lives um, and, and adjusting to that. Michael, how about you? Yep. So one of the things that we did early on was um, changed all the uh, security awareness programs to be more relatable to protecting your family at home and protecting your home devices. So, you know, I, I, I would almost guarantee that 70, 80 percent, and I pulled that number out of the air, of home routers either have the default uh, admin credentials or at least have the ISP providers default admin credentials. So, so going through and changing that and setting up a guest network on your home router for your work devices, you know, so that you separate all the IoT stuff, you know, the, the smart televisions and lights and switches that you have in your home that are all susceptible to, you know, attacks, separating them from the device that you're going to be using for work. And, um, you know, teaching you how to do password management and, and segregating your, um, you know, your, your banking passwords from your social media passwords from your work passwords and making that relevant to the home user in their practice so that they then bring those habits back into work. It's simple. It's, it's funny. You make it so simple, right? The things yeah. that you just listed off are very simple things. Very simple that things. Everyone, right, should be doing. But let's face it, how, how many people are thinking about that? No. Right? They're not thinking about that because, oh, I got to make dinner. Oh, shoot, I got that deadline. There's so many other things that people are thinking about as opposed to just those simple things and the simple changes they can make. Okay. And so have you seen, Michael, um, have you seen a shift? Have you um, seen the shift of the attack vectors, um, targets against um, your organizations? Or And I know, you know, there's certain things you may all want to talk about. I mean, you, you can't. But, um, you know, are you seeing that threat vector change for your end users? And what, what against your organization? Right. So, so we're seeing an awful lot more uh, phishing attacks, that style of thing. It's, it's escalating. Now, I don't know whether that's a direct um, correlation to COVID or it's just, you know, but, but um, people being at home, when you're inside of the corporation, you have a lot more of uh, tooling that would block those attacks and block those uh, phishing attempts and such. Um, being at home, it, it's, yeah, it's just different and, and a lot more of it's actually getting through to the endpoint. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Summer, how about you? So yeah, de definitely like we, we, we seen a shift on the attack vectors now and, and as, as Michael said, most of the people are sitting home now and actually when you sit at home and work, your mental capacity that you are not at the office sometimes make you slip and make a quick decisions on certain things. So yeah. the phishing attacks is still the same with, with different subject line, with different link every time to, to use. And because you are sitting at home, as you said, in your living room, in your kitchen, in your wherever you work from home, you always have the motivation to click that link and see what's happened, even though you know that this is fake, even though you know that this sounds too good to be true and it's phishing. And if you are in the office, sometimes you give it a second thought. 
So yes, we see shift in, 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 in the surface of, of the attack, but also we start see more increase on, on, on attacking the back end solution, the back end infrastructure, because mm -hmm. most of the companies in a rush, they start opening actually their, their, their back end, uh, maybe servers and applications for their, the users working from home. They start adding mm -hmm. more holes to their firewalls. They start adding more rules in their firewalls to allow everybody to come and do certain things on, on the servers. So getting things done in a rush sometimes make the security people miss or, or misconfigure some of the security configuration in your defense line. So in, in, in the same attitude, I will say, or same, same magnitude on seeing attack on individuals like the phishing attacks, we start also see attacks on the infrastructure utilizing the vulnerabilities and the zero days. And, and we hear about this more often now in the last, I will say, six to seven months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really skyrocketed. We saw in, um, in March. So for those of you who aren't aware, Zscaler has what we call, it's the threat labs. It's actually a, um, an elite group that actually monitors the entire Zscaler network globally, over 150 data centers. In the month of March alone, they saw um, malicious activity increase by 30,000%. I had to keep rereading the numbers because I was like, wait, are, is this really 30,000%? And what's interesting about that in your comments, um, both of you about phishing is 85% of that 30,000% was, was actually tied to phishing. And that's how much of the phishing attacks had increased in one month's time when all this occurred. That's why I said, you know, going back to that, they're coming out of the woodwork, the bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. Attacking, trying to attack your end users. But Shahid, how about you? How, how have you seen your, your attack vectors and all that change? Uh, again, uh, our attack vectors uh, have not significantly changed other than what we've seen a significant increase on the phishing side. Uh, what we have seen, one thing is more targeted, so like business email compromise, uh, where, you know, emails are coming in, uh, because now people are not in the office, so you can't like just really walk over to, let's say, Oliveria and say like, hey, did you really send me that email? <laughs> so people are getting emails like, hey, uh, I'm doing this deal, I need some money transferred, like, let's make it happen. So we, we've noticed very targeted uh, stuff happening around that and around the uh, around just generally in the leagues itself, like the NBA and NHL, like we've seen a lot of fishing. So one thing what we've been continuously doing that uh, even before COVID was uh, like everyone's touch on is security awareness. Uh, and, and what Michael touched on is, you know, we, we did a, we've always done a similar campaign, but we just focused a little bit more on, so we do uh, very uh, highly graphical infographics for our company across the organizations. And then we get the analytics to see how many people have opened it, how many people have read it through. So it gives us a lot, lot more data on it. Uh, so we, what we've done is we've done campaigns like how to protect your home, how to protect your Wi-Fi, uh, the do's and don'ts of working from home, Right, you know, and we've also touched on physical security because if you're home, you might be going for a walk, you might leave your laptop in the in, at home thinking that nobody might come in, and we've heard about break ins and stuff, or you're in a car. Uh, and the other thing we've always continued to do that, and, and we made sure that we did not stop through COVID was our phishing simulation attacks that we do on all employees. Uh, and, and we made sure that we're not just focused on people clicking the link, but you know, clicking the link, uh, to me is, is a good understanding of what, what people are clicking on, but if we have the right security tools that should help you protect them against malware, but it's what type of information they're providing. So we've been doing a lot of that, and 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 after that, we sort of do specific training for certain departments and stuff. So so that's what we've been uh, seeing, and our attack vectors have, I guess, not significantly changed, but we've seen an increase in it. Uh, great. It's all about education, right? Agreed. How do you keep, keep reassuring? Because I think to your point, you're not going ahead and, you know, you don't have, you know, hey, Mary, did you get that email? Oh, my yes. to Is that good? You know, you don't have that exactly. going on, right? And, and it's really important because it goes all back to education to the end users yeah. and, and remembering what to do yeah. and what not to do. And, and and one last thing, you know, with uh, with COVID, people are not in, me uh, people are in meetings, but they're in meetings in front of the computer before they would be in an office. With a, so now there's a lot more 
higher probability of people clicking on things that they've never done clicked on before. So that's what we've noticed too. It's, it's there's no water cooler conversation taking place, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Or passing in the hall. Alvira, how about you? How, how have you seen? It's actually the same. I think it's even more important for Huawei. Uh, cybersecurity is a top priority. And actually we have a very rigorous training and testing for the people. Mm -hmm. and that they clearly understand their responsibility. And uh, every six months they have to do the training, they have to do the test. Uh, sometimes we even use a reminder, like a st sticker on a laptop for the stuff like uh, phishing emails and stuff like that. So we, we actually go an extra mile. So I'd say uh, training and testing, like <laughs> testing to make sure people clearly understand their responsibility and consequences to the organization if they do something wrong. Great. So with that, we're kind of coming to um, the end of our hour. I can't believe we're ready, but I wanted to leave some time in case we have any questions. So if you could, um, Alvira, could you just give us some lasting thoughts that you want to leave with um, those that are, are watching this today? What would you like to say? Uh, I would like to wrap up this discussion by saying that actually cybersecurity is literally everybody's responsibilities. And I'd like to say that it starts from the top. So once you train and educate your top management on the importance of cybersecurity, you're going to have a budget to implement controls. You're going to have a budget to implement the testing and all the tools you need. And also, uh, like, they have to give you a power to do that, to implement it. Also, organizations have to think about reporting structure, like, uh, who do you want your CISO to report to in order to make sure people understand how critical the role is? So I would like to wrap up this discussion saying that really uh, cybersecurity awareness training starting from the top and understanding the role we play and getting the upper management support really is the key to being successful. Great, thank you. Shahid. I, I, I would uh, say a couple of things. So the first thing is, uh, uh, as, as a leader in any, and this is just for anybody who is either on this, uh, who is leading cybersecurity organizations or wants to, I think this is this in this time where we are, uh, if you if we haven't sort of gone back and looked at our overall organizational risk assessments and and sort of looked at what our top risks are, I think it would be a really good time to see if your risk posture has changed for your organization. So doing sort of a review of that to see what you had before, is it still aligns? And if it doesn't, you might want to pivot really fast and see what are the new top risks for your organization. And also tying the risk to the attack vectors and the threats is, are the threats landscape change for you or, or they're still the same? Uh, having that understanding sort of like a like a redo like a you know sort of like a reflection on your own security program is important the other thing i would say is like a lot of organizations are going like you touch on Pamela, are going through massive digital transformation through this time and i think as cso's we have a great opportunity to play a strategic role and not just be the protectors of organization where we work with our leaders who are leading these digital transformation initiatives to say how can i be helping you enable this faster. So being involved in those type of conversations and projects and understand how you can help the business pivot also. And, you know, I think no organization can say that they've not struggled with revenue uh, or protecting revenue. So I think uh, cybersecurity leaders have a great opportunity to say how you can enable bringing in new revenue or protecting the revenue by helping with digital transformation. That's great. Awesome. Summer. How about you? So I would say your your security program is 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 strong as as you have uh, strong elements within that program. So you have people, you have technology, and you have many other smaller entities in between. So you need to focus on all of them. But from my perspective, the focus should be on the weakest link usually within this this group, which is which is human. Uh, you can buy the tools, you can buy the technology, you can configure the technology, but at the end of the day, it is the user who can make it or break it for your organization. So focus on the user, focus on the education for the users, focus on taking more of their hands from a decision-making perspective for your security. So get, get, get proper tool in place to detect phishing emails and quarantine them. Get, uh, a good technology to do the DLP so they cannot attach uh, 
uh, some type of data to, you, to their emails. So focusing, make, make the users as your focus point and, and move out of that, of that focal point. Most of the data breaches or data leakage, let's, let's say, happened because of users. And we are all aware of the very famous incident happened three weeks back where a big technology company, big name in that, in that domain with all the technology controls in place and, and, and product, products in place, it was a one user at the end of the day who make uh, a very bad move within the company and may create a bad, bad damage for them. So fo focus, on your, focus on your users and, and make them the center of your attention from a security perspective. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Michael. Lasting thoughts. Okay, and so I'm going to leverage all of the, the previous three. So, so um, having your, your end user as the focus um, makes identity your new perimeter. I think I mm -hmm. said this in another conversation. Um, with, with identity, you can have context. So, so set it up so that I know who's on the device by their credentials. Um, Multi-factor authentication. So, so you know, we've we've added a layer of security onto their their credentials, and then we know the device that they're on. Okay, we know the network that the device is connected to. Is it a private network in their home? Is it a public network at Starbucks? Is it a corporate LAN? Okay, um, so we know the person. We know the device they're on. We know the network that they're on. We know the time of day they're coming in from. Start building contextual models around your end users, and then set baselines. So what is normal in a communication pattern for our company? And then anything outside of that becomes an anomaly. And you can do that when your users are at home as well. I think that goes right down to the fact of you have to protect the end users irrelevant to where they are, yep. right? And you know, I, I, this has been a great conversation Let's go ahead and see if we have any questions out there. We have about 10 minutes left. Hi, Pam. This is Farwa from Team CyberX. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, so I'll just read them out for you. And we have about eight minutes left. So the first question okay. for you is, um, with shifts in political landscapes, we are seeing enterprise being attacked and sabotaged. What has changed? if any, in your threat intelligence gathering practices? Anyone want to chime in on that one? Hmm. So maybe I can just start. So I think it's very important to share that intelligence. And I think we all have responsibilities to educate each other on the risk. So I think organizations like we in Canada have uh, Canadian Cyber Track Exchange organization where you can pay for the membership and get information about the recent uh, threat factors and stuff like that. I think uh, we have to come up with a way to be more open and share this information. And I understand this comes with a risk because if you actually experience a breach or if you have a problem with your organization, it's not easy to step up and talk about that. So I think we have to find a way to, to report about these issues without talking about people who experienced it in the past. But it's a valuable information. We have collective responsibility to protect each other. So I think this would be my advice that uh, I think I would like to say we have collective responsibility to help each other and share this information. I think you're right. I think the thing that really comes down to it though is um, you've seen it happen, um, you know, where somebody's come forward because they had to. They had to go ahead and talk about a breach that they had, and it really does affect their company reputation, right? Because then, then users, consumers are sitting back saying, well, do I want to do business with them? And why am I, you know, quite frankly, I went to, you know, I stopped at a local store, and they were, this store was part of a breach a, a number, a couple years ago. And I didn't want to use my credit card. And I thought to myself, okay, well, I'm only going to buy enough because that's the only cash I have. Right? So it really does, I think, affect people. But, but to your point, how do we go ahead and have more of that, um, hey, this is what's out there, 
right? This is what people are being affected. I think, Shahid, you had a, you had a thought? Well, I would just uh, like, uh, I totally agree with uh, Oliveria that, you know, uh, we have to share more. So I think depending on the industry you're in, I think that if the more industry organizations within that industry get together and start sharing that information and, and just talk about how they're doing it. So like sports is a perfect example, like, you know, MLSC owns a Raptors, a basketball team, a hockey team, a soccer team. And so we work directly with the leagues. We've created bodies where we all get together and talk about what what's the threat landscape looks like, what the league is seeing, what the teams are seeing. But then we also discuss like, you know, not every team has a big budget when it comes to technology or security. So sharing our best practices with the other teams so that way they don't have to try to hire a consultant to do those things. So I think that's really helped in our industry in sports and entertainment, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think that's key though, because you, you chimed on that something, the fact that, you know, companies don't have these massive budgets and especially going through the um, last six months, right? There's so much focus on financials and making, you know, the bottom line, the bottom numbers and so forth. And what are companies going to be able to do and what aren't they going to be able to do and where are they going to spend that money? And I think that's where it focuses on companies need to focus on what is the right technology? You know, um, what is the technology that's going to give them visibility and stop those bad, those bad vectors, before, like I, I keep going back to, stop it before it gets the end user so that this way the education is only a component in that which you're relying on, right? Yeah. And one last thing I, I would say, sorry, I, I'm taking, is one thing I'm really, uh, like, I'm amazed that I've seen in the sports world because I've only been in two years is that, you know, the teams get together and do a survey and say what technology you're using. So if everyone's using, let's say, a, I won't name any brands, but if they're using a specific company, for, for multi-factor authentication or 2FA, then the league or a few teams reach out to that vendor and say, hey, all 30 teams are gonna use this, give us bigger discounts. Mm -hmm. And what we're showing is that, that that power is starting to give us bigger discounts and make it easier for the individual teams to then purchase these products. And then implement the right technology, I mean, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. Um, so the next question is, Recognizing that looking at every employee and deciding their required level of access is impossible for medium to large companies. What can these companies do to execute successful access management? I, I can, I can I take go. the lead. And, you want to chime in? Yeah, I can, <laughs> definitely. Uh, so actually, like again, if, if you are in a, in a huge enterprise company and you have thousands of employees, yes, you cannot tailor an access level for each individual within the organization. So I think the trend going to role-based access is how most of the organizations are doing it now. So a group of people doing the same function for the organization, they will have the same, the same access. This is make it much easier to manage, much easier to deploy for the organizations, and you will not uh, have too many roles within the organization. Like every organization have HR, accounting, finance, uh, IT, marketing, whatever, and, and different level of users within each one of them. So role-based uh, access, I think it's the key for, for such a, a problem. I agree completely. And I think we may have time for one more question. For sure, yep. So we have just about two minutes left and I will just read the question out now. In your experience, has the pandemic shifted or altered the service level agreements between your enterprise and vendors? How has the support experience shifted? Michael, do you wanna So, comment? So, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna step out of this question because my companies are small enough that we haven't um, done the SLA work yet. Okay. Summer, I would say change. my SLA to my users within the company have been changed because previously it was eight to five, everybody in the office, everybody working, then they go home. Now it's, listen, I, I need to finish this. It's a 3 a.m. on Sunday morning and I need my system up. So our SLA actually as an IT professionals towards our internal users have been shifted a lot, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just to add to what Samir said is, uh, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is like third party vendor risk assessments and management. So if you as an organization had done a good job at the start when you're onboarding these vendors, uh, your SLAs should not be significantly impacted if you're using 
big organization for cloud products. But if you're using a small shop, uh, you might have. Uh, but I agree with Samir. We've, we've seen more of a shift where RSLAs with our employees have changed where, you know, you have to be on calls at 10 p.m. that you've never been before. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, Bear. Um, so we actually had a very strict SLAs in place uh, before. So uh, I didn't have to do much modification because, as I said, uh, our SLAs are part of our contracts and uh, we have a big, we pay a lot of attention to cybersecurity requirements. So, um, yeah, so it's a lot of knowledge has been put into that over the last 10 years. So we didn't have to touch it this time. Great. Well, I think with that being said, I think that's all for our time for our questions. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and thank um, all of you, the four of you very much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, you know, just looking from the dynamics of each of you, where you're all coming from and what, you know, you've been able to do with your organizations and then also be able to share that with all the organizations that are listening today. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm Pam Kubitowski from Zscaler. Uh, please let us know, any of you out there listening, how maybe we can uh, go ahead and talk further about some of the things we talked about today or how we may be able to help you and your end users going forward. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.